also look at what the specifications imply. Here's a box, and I've covered over the thing so you can't see the logo. That's sold or marketed as a 90 by 60 loudspeaker. And then they provide, thankfully, a graph that proves it's a 90 by 60 loudspeaker. Great! Or is it? Let's take a look at the graph. So, to make things easier, I've marked the 90 and 60 degree points. So, in case you don't understand what the graph is, this axis, what we call the x-axis, is frequency in a logarithmic scale, starting at the low frequencies, the low pitch sounds and working up to the high pitch sounds. And, and for those of you who might be new to this, I should say that in audio and acoustics, everything is dependent on frequency. Or more precisely, everything is dependent on wavelength. I used to teach an intro to acoustics class, day one, first thing out of my mouth. In acoustics, nothing is large, nothing is small. It's all relative to the wavelength. And in our normal daily activities, we often don't run across things that are not linear. We don't know what that means. But in audio, nothing is linear. Everything depends on the frequency or wavelength. Everything. Everything. All right, so here we have a frequency scale. And then this scale goes from 0 to 360. This is a scale of beam width, or how wide the coverage is. So I've marked 90 by 60. Now, you tell me where this box is 90 by 60. Well, it's certainly not 90 by 60 down here at 100. It's 300 to 60. So 100 hertz goes everywhere. And it's that way all the way until 300 some odd hertz. But even between 300 and 400, 500, it's still essentially omni. It's greater than 100 degrees anyway, right? And the squares are horizontal, I believe. Yes, and the triangles are vertical. So the horizontal and vertical are essentially the same, tracking all the way up through to 1,000 hertz. At 1,000 hertz, this box is 90 by 90. This is their data. This is not my data. This is data from the people who built the speaker. It doesn't become a 90 by 60 until here. And that point is around 4 kilohertz. From 4 kilohertz to 10 kilohertz, roughly, yeah, some variation. I can live with that. This is a 90 by 60. So what? Is this a lie? Well, it's not a lie, but... <sighs> It is a little bit of a stretch to call that a 90 by 60 box, yeah? I mean, here's another one. I defy you to find anywhere on that graph <laughs> where this box is 90 by 60. You won't find it. It's not there. At no frequency is this loudspeaker 90 by 60. And yet, that's what it's marketed as. Well, you know, so what? Well, here's a little experiment that I put together that is admittedly a little contrived. I admit it. But sometimes you have to sort of overstate something to make a point. So I admit that I'm doing that. Bear with me. Here's a recording of an instrumental. This is um, a piece called uh, Gospel According to Hammond. There's a lovely Hammond organ and some jazz, and it's a great piece. I could listen to it. This is full range. I will admit there's something about the musician in me that feels like I'm doing violence <laughs> to the art 
by turning that off. You know what I mean? I, I hate it when, when I'm listening to a tune and I really love it and some guy up front goes, okay, that's enough of that, boom. Well, wait a minute, I like that tune, you know? And I apologize. But we're trying to teach something here. All right, so what would happen if I took that piece of music and filtered it at four kilohertz? How much do you think would be left? So here's that same piece of music with a four kilohertz low pass filter, 18 dB per octave filter, set at four kilohertz, low pass. Here's what happens. Now, you know, if you didn't like that, I got some bad news for you. Wait a few years because that's what your ears are going to do to everything. <laughs> I speak from experience. No, I actually, I still can hear out to about 11K, but I'm losing that. I'm actually thankful I'll never hear 16K again. <laughs> I don't miss that. Maybe I'm not thankful. I don't know. All right, but check it out. What if we played you the high pass? Here's the stuff above 4 kilohertz. Remember, in this speaker, this would be the stuff that the loudspeaker actually has control over. This would be the stuff that goes in that 90 by 60 pattern, and the rest of it, I suggest, to varying degrees, goes everywhere. So let's see what part of the mu music is actually controlled by this 90 by 60 loudspeaker. Here we go. Now, I don't feel so bad about turning this off, you know what I mean? There's not much there to listen to. I mean, there is, and for some of you young people, there might be a lot there to listen to. But to my aging ears, there's not much there. And I suggest that what is there may not even be the most important part. That may be a subjective call on my part, but I think you certainly can agree that that tune deserved to be controlled better than just the highs going here and everything else going everywhere else, right? Okay, and admittedly, this is contrived. You might find different music that has a lot more information above four kilohertz, and that, that would be, but here's one that's even more dramatic. Again, admittedly contrived. Here's a recording, again, one of my favorite recordings, my, one of my favorite artists, that consists of simply piano and alto voice. Beautiful recording with lots of detail. This is one of the tracks that we use often to demonstrate Danley loudspeakers because it has a, an awesome amount of tender detail. You can hear the, the, the hammers and the dampers on the, on, the, on the strings of the piano. You can hear detail in her voice that's remarkable, yeah? It's a beautiful recording, a beautiful song. 
Let's listen to the low frequency portion of that crossed over at 4 kilohertz with an 18 dB per octave crossover. So here's the low pass of the same tune. You can't see me yet Seeing takes a long, long time Okay. Sorry, Mary Chapin Carpenter. Here's what happens if you high-pass it at 4 kilohertz with an 18 dB per octave crossover. So I played this song through those loudspeakers, those 90 by 60. This is the portion which the horn would control. Not much. Right? So what can we learn from this? Well, to wrap up the thing on specifications, specifications only deal with the objective. Right? They can't deal with the subjective. And don't be tempted to make leaps from the objective to the subjective. Wow, this spec sheet looks great. I bet you that speaker sounds great. We're tempted to do it. Resist that. Make sure you understand what all those numbers and squiggles mean. Make sure the graphs all have scales. Examine the details. And remember that those details might actually be telling you the truth, but they don't want you to see it. So I'm sure the manufacturer of that 90 by 60 horn is hoping you don't examine that graph. They're putting it there. They're telling you the truth. But I think they're kind of secretly wishing you wouldn't go there because it's, the data are not flattering. Okay, um, I've just inadvertently moved on to the next section here, computer models. And I'm not going to say a whole lot about computer models other than a model is only as good as the data. And let's think for a moment, you, you know what I'm talking about, people will come with ease models or various, you know, whatever, and they'll say, okay, here's a model of what's going to happen. Okay, great. Please develop a healthy skepticism for any model presented to you. Because think about it for a minute. Where can errors creep in? Errors can creep in that the model isn't built very well. Errors can creep in that the person building the model has a vested interest in you buying the product and may tweak it a little bit. And you'll never know. Errors can creep into the model because the data, the loudspeaker data for the virtual speakers in there might be corrupted. You have no way of knowing. Yeah. Okay. So there's lots of places where models can be manipulated. And just because a computer says it's true, don't mean it's true. And if you don't believe that, take a course in computer programming sometime. What about shootouts? I'm moving a little quickly here because we're trying to get a, a, another seminar in this morning. <laughs> Computer shootouts, uh, computer shootouts, okay. What about shootouts? You know, shootouts are, are maybe a good way to listen to competitors' products in the same space. Yeah, it's a good idea. But, obviously, that whole experience can be manipulated. So here's some rules maybe to remember, some things to think about. You need a neutral consultant to be involved. If you've got a, somebody running a shootout who sells brand X, you better believe that he or she is going to make brand X sound better than A, B, C, D, and e, e, F, and F that are there. So you need somebody running the show who does not have a vested interest in the outcome. They don't care which one you buy. Their job is to do a fair 
present a fair comparison. And if you can't do that, be very, very skeptical about the outcome of a shootout. The second thing, and this is really important, when you're attending a shootout and you're listening, listen to those elements of the loudspeaker that cannot be manipulated. So in other words, probably the least important thing is to listen how the speaker sounds. Because with a little EQ, you can make any speaker sound like anything. And maybe another thing to do is ask to go to the board and try to EQ it yourself and see how quickly the loudspeaker responds to EQ changes. You'll find some speakers where you've got to crank the knobs considerably before you hear any changes. Other speakers, a mere touch is like, whoa, that's interesting. That says something. But more importantly, listen to those things which cannot be manipulated by software. For example, coverage pattern. Walk off axis. If it's a horn that's supposed to be 90 by 60, because that was what the spec sheet says, figure out where 90 degrees is and walk past it. At 90 degrees, you ought to hear some kind of a change. If you don't, huh, why not? Why not? and insist on measurements. I've been to a lot of shootouts where, oh no, 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 no measurements. Really, why not? Especially Stippa. Because even though in some of the forms of worship, especially in the, in the celebratory, um, which is, you know, full disclosure, that's the style that I worship in, intelligibility is important, but not that important. But for the rest of those styles, it's, it's very significant. If you can't hear the preaching, and, and more importantly, understand the preaching to the Baptists, that's a big deal. But even to us Anglicans, it's a big deal, because once in a while, we'd like to be able to hear the homily. <laughs> right? So insist on measurements, especially intelligibility measurements. And the final thing I want to bring to your attention today is please, 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 five pleases, insist on a performance specification. If you're in the market for a sound system, the first thing you must do is sit down with your committee and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to write a specification for what the sound system must do. And furthermore, we're going to hold anybody who responds to our request for proposal we're going to hold them to these specs such that if your speaker system does not do what our performance specs suggest it should, maybe we won't pay you. Or maybe we'll ask you to make it better. Or maybe we have some way of compelling you to make it right. What I find curious is that many churches, many organizations will spend many tens of thousands of dollars for a product that there's no guarantees on what it will do. We won't find that. We wouldn't find that acceptable in any other context. You wouldn't buy a car that's rated at, you know, 30 miles per gallon, and even though we know MPG will vary with your driving abilities or, or preferences or whatever, if that car got three miles a gallon, what would you do? You'd bring it back to the dealer and say, I'm sorry, I'm getting three miles a gallon here. And that dealer would have to do something about it because although, you know, if you came back and said, well, I'm not getting 40, I'm getting 39, they'd say, well, you know, come on, get a life. But if it's getting three, you have to have some recourse. So performance specification, number one, an intelligibility of at least 0.6 stippa. At least. and preferably better than that. But if they say, oh yeah, okay, yeah, we get that, and the system's installed and you walk around with your stipometer and you're seeing point fours, somebody needs to get sued here. Or if not sued, pressure needs to be brought to bear to get it fixed, because that's, that's not acceptable. And even coverage of plus or minus three dB from every, in every seat. Now I'm not suggesting you go to every seat and take a measurement. Although, if you have to, do it. But usually one measurement or two measurements in each seating section will be enough 
But there's no reason, by, with today's technology, there's no reason why that section of the church shouldn't be covered as well as this section. There's absolutely no reason for that. And if they tell you, well, yes, there is, and especially if the sound system guy is blaming the acoustics, you've got a problem. Insist on even coverage. Come up with a specification for the maximum sound, sound level at the furthest listener. Not that you should necessarily always achieve that, but, it, you know, like the car analogy, if, if the guy says this car should be able to do 110 on the, on the Autobahn, and you happen to take it to the Autobahn and it barely makes it up to 50, somebody lied. Specify the frequency response in the range. The system shall go from 80 hertz to 16 kilohertz, or 40 hertz to 16 kilohertz. I don't care what it is. That's going to depend on what kind of church you are, what kind of worship style you have. And the frequency response, you can specify that too. Generally, we look for plus or minus 3 or 4 dB from a certain range. But have a spec in there. And if you don't know how to write this, this would be a great time to hire a consultant to help you write it and make sure that consultant doesn't have a vested interest in the outcome. Put in a statement about the, something like this. The system shall have freedom from hum, buzz, and rattles. Have you ever been in a sound system and they turn on its home? Why is it humming? Well, it doesn't know the words. Well, maybe it does know the words. <laughs> maybe it's a bad install. Yeah? Ever heard a system where every time, you know, something, the kick drum hits or whatever, there's buzz or rattles or whatever? Well, sometimes it's the drum, yeah. But sometimes it isn't. So, you know, if you think it's the drum, play a recording of a drum that you know doesn't have rattles and buzzes in it because you've listened to it other places and it doesn't. Well, if it does in your church, that's a problem with the sound system. Get it fixed. Why do I have to tolerate that? And uh, another obvious one, immunity from RF. You don't want to necessarily be sitting in church and hear, you know, some radio station breaking in. It happens. It shouldn't. Finally, if a computer model is submitted as part of the submittal, it must be verified. Make them come in and prove when the system is done that it meets the spec the model predicted. You'll be surprised at how few people are willing to do that. And if that's the case, in my opinion, they have no business building models in the first place. And I know I'm being harsh on <laughs> installers. Yep. I think for too often, installers have gotten away with a lot of stuff they shouldn't get away with. And they will continue to do so until you, the church, begin to hold them accountable. And finally, the slide that we've been waiting for for quite some time now. Any questions? Well... Thank you very much, then. We're going to get set up for the next one. Thank you.